Welcome, everybody. My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm excited to be hosting the first in a series of roundtable events that we are hosting with the Shabak Festival. The topic of today's roundtable is a decade of Shabak, the history of the festival. It is my honor to introduce our three uh, special guests, all of whom are from the Shabak team in London. We have Eckard, who is the festival artistic director, Tagrid, who is a senior programmer and festival producer, and Riwa, who is a member of the Young Shabak group. I'm really excited that you are all here. Thank you and welcome to our Fikra. Pleasure. Hello. So I think what may make sense uh, is uh, since it's supposed to be a round table, let's round it out and give you all an opportunity to introduce yourselves a little more um, informally. And maybe we'll start with the order that we see on the screen. Maybe we'll start with Eckerd. Um, tell, tell me and everybody else on the call, when did you first become uh, involved with Shabak? What were you doing before? And what are you doing now on the team? Great, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Yes, I'm the artistic director of Shabak, and I have been since 2012. Uh, so after the very first festival in 2011, uh, and my role is really to bring together the program for each festival um, with my colleagues, with other curators, um, and shape the kind of conceptual thinking behind the programming. Um, I have promoted the work of Arab artists uh, for about 20 years before that here in the UK and internationally. My own art form specialism is dance um, and then probably visual arts and then I've branched out more into music and the theater as well. So I've worked for festivals, I've worked for the Cultural Olympiad, the cultural program of the um, Olympic Games in London in 2012. Um, I worked for Birmingham International Dance Festival, run Woking International Dance Festival, um, and yeah, mainly in dance and kind of promotion of contemporary Arab culture. Uh, let's pass it off to you. Thanks so much, Eckhart. My first uh, encounter with Shabak was uh, as an audience member. I uh, stumbled upon a gig in a square of Zed and the Wings, and I was immediately uh, taken to a version of home. You know, that this, I hadn't been in London that long, and there's such a disconnect when you're having to absorb a new environment and build kind of your new living conditions that um, I instantly found community in a, in a matter of minutes. So that is my first encounter with Shabak. I then uh, performed uh, in the 2015 festival and I joined as a producer and later uh, in 2018 and later I've become a programmer, so kind of a curator and and producer and really uh, uh, my kind of path into into curating and producing was very accidental I was doing it before I kind of knew what it was called so it was purely out of the need to function in in a particular mode to get the work that I wanted to do um, happen you know as a as a performer from a from a theatre background um, you've got to, you've got to pick up all the tools that you can um, to make the work happen. And so I was also working in uh, a lot of non-artistic environments, but using uh, participatory artistic practices. And, um, and then in 2018, the, there, was a, there was a job opening uh, calling for a producer to join Shabak and, um, and, so, and so I did. Before, before we go to Riwa, I have a, I have a basic question. Okay, if you were to explain to like a 12 year old what a producer is, what is a producer? You basically bring uh, people and places and things and you connect them. <laughs> to, to, it, it's really the space in between um, all those players and settings and uh, it's, it's, it's creating those experiences and, and ensuring really, I think, that people are cared for um, and that, that work happens. Uh, you know that that um, that there's real integrity for 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 an artistic process, and and you're building that framework to hold it together. Cool. Okay, great. You will take it away. Hello. 
Um, so my encounter with Shabak, so um, a little bit of backstory for that. So I grew up in Beirut and I moved to London in 2018 to study performance and creative enterprise at Guildhall School of Music and Drama. So I came here and I was like, my intention is let me come here where there's a giant hub for culture and arts. Let me learn what I can, pick up the tools that I can and build bridges. And so I go through my first term and I'm like, cool, I'm experiencing so much art, but where are the Arabs? Where's the Arab art? I can't, I don't know where it is. So the first thing that I found was a one festival, part of Arts Canteen, Arab Women Artists Now. And they had this um, night of rehearsed readings and Tagrid was performing. So I'm like, this is amazing. Look at all of these theater makers and people telling Arab stories. It was based in Beirut, Iraq, everywhere. So I go up to her and the other um, theater makers afterwards. I'm like, hi, I just moved here. I came from Beirut. This is incredible to see. And Tagrid goes, hi, nice to meet you. Um, check out Shabak. We also do more of this stuff. And this is going to happen later on in the year. I'm like, amazing. So now this world is opening up for me at this point of other like-minded people, people that speak my language, the arts and the region. Um, and I attended Shabak Festival to watch it. I watched Ex Adra. I watched their, their documentaries at the Barbican Cinema. And there was just so much that I was taking away. And um, by that point, I was like, emailing Tahrid like, hello, can we meet for a coffee? It'd be great to speak further. And that's when she told me about Young Shabak. And Young Shabak is the collective of young producers um, aged 16 to 26. But um, so, and we're around 20, over 20 people. We're around 20 people. And it's just everyone, everyone comes from different backgrounds. So I come from a theater, music and poetry background and everyone comes up from other places. And we're also just interested in figuring out how to make the art that we love happen. Um, and yeah, that's me and how I encountered you back. So cool. Thanks so much for the, the intro. Okay, so I feel fully equipped to, to dive into some of this stuff. But before, I, before we go back in time, um, I want to watch the, the uh, trailer for today's, uh, for this year's um, festival, and then zoom back 10 years ago and try to connect the dots. So let's watch the trailer. I want to zoom back and talk about the the actual mission statement of, uh, of Shabak, right? If you go to the website, you see Shabak Festival is the UK's largest biennial festival of contemporary Arab culture. It brings new and unexpected voices alongside established artists to London every two years. Um, and the scope includes visual arts, film, music, theater, dance, literature, and debate. So if we think about the decade of the festival, has it always been uh, similarly broad in scope and has the mission always been about contemporary Arab culture bringing that to London? Has that always been the, the mission? And if so, do you have a sense of why? I think the very, I think the very first festival was about bringing contemporary Arab culture to London. And I think we moved from there to presenting and, de and developing and creating contemporary Arab culture wherever it is, within London and outside London and in the region itself. The story of Shabak is actually quite interesting. Um, 
in 27, so way, way before Shabak, there was an India Now Festival, one, one summer season that the mayor of London had organized. And in 2009, there was a um, China Now Festival, which uh, the mayor had organized. Those were uncurated festivals that um, really wanted to position London as a globally connected city. Um, and engaging with the kind of economic emerging nations uh, uh, across the globe. And the last one in that series was really the idea to connect with the Gulf and the wider Arab um, world through Shabak. So Shabak was something already quite different in that it dealt with more than one nation. Um, it was planned in 2010 and took place in the summer of 2011. And of course, in the middle of it, in December 2010, um, January 2011, you had the so-called Arab Spring, you had revolutions in Egypt and Syria and Libya, etc. And Shubak became something quite different to the previous India and, um, uh, and China celebratory summers. It became a festival that was much more about the today. It was about, um, uh, it was about current affairs. It was about bringing culture into the mix of the discourse around the Arab world. And that was really, really important. What that also led to, which I thought was really fantastic, I, in that year, have to say, wasn't working for Shabak. I was actually curating the Liverpool Arabic Arts Festival in, in, that, in that year. And some of the work we'd invited there then made it into the first Shubak, so the uh, piece by Ahmed al Attar we brought over from Cairo, then was also shown in London with, in partnership with the Lift Festival. Um, but this kind of historic moment led to the steering group that had advised the mayor um, to think through that Shubak should not be a one off event, that there is a, a real need and a responsibility. Um, and a desire to connect with and through culture. Um, and the Shabak then became an independent organization led by Omar Qatan with some seed funding from the Qatan Foundation and the invitation to an artistic director to shape the content of the festival more. Before that, it was more of an umbrella um, into which individual venues could program into. So this is really then when I started, and I think from 2013, um, the mission of the festival has been very much what you've just shown on the screen. It's about making connections. It, really, really interesting. I, I didn't know the some of the backstory there. This article that I have on the screen is this Guardian article written um, right ahead of the first the first festival, and, and you can't read it there. Maybe it's too small. But the opening line says, the first festival of contemporary Arab arts will spread across London this July, conceived more than two years ago, and hastily reprogrammed to include the tumult of the Arab Spring. Um, and so I wonder, it, what is it a sense of like, is there a revolutionary spirit that is inextricably linked to the festival's programming that needed to be included at that moment and that still is part of the DNA or um, is that a misreading, do you think? I, well, I think what's really remained is there's a very strong ambition to always stay very, very close to the current moment. Um, we are a festival that's not just driven by aesthetics, you know, sort of finding the, the nicest or the most beautiful things somewhere and bring them to us. It's about how arts and culture connect to the today and whatever that might be. So in that way, it is about agency and revolutions. So for instance, in the 2017 festival, um, you know, we had um, explored very much the experience of artists who had experienced migration. It was at the time when so many Syrian artists um, relocated first in Beirut and, and Jordan and then in, into Europe. In the 2019 festival, we had a real focus on rethinking what sexuality and sexual identity is. 
So we've always tried to stay very much to what a very current discourse is. And I think uh, that has remained, and that's what's exciting about Shubak. It's not disconnected from the urgent matters in the world. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, Tagrid, maybe I can uh, pose this question to you and Riwa as well. Um, but I'll start with you. Um, this idea of contemporary Arab culture, this, this is something that I struggle with uh, digesting and unpacking through Afikra. Um, so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how you unpack this to yourself. Um, how do you think through that three word phrase, like contemporary Arab culture, particularly from a vantage point of London where, where the culture, the Arab culture in London um, may be different than the contemporary Arab culture in Morocco and the contemporary Arab culture in Chile and the contemporary culture in Oman um, and Berlin and, and you know, Turkey and all this different stuff. So how do you, how do you think about programming in a, in a way that's relevant and in, in touch? Yes, um, I think relevancy um, comes from allowing work to emerge from a specific context. I think a lot of the times there's a lot of talk about universality. Oh, this work is so is so poignant because it's universal. And then if you, if you're really going to unpick that, what does that mean? You know, and particularly in in the context of contemporary Arab culture, sometimes turning to universality as a safe space actually negates a lot of specific and um, lived experience. And I think it's about really turning to what that lived experience is in, in our locality. And um, with, with Shabak in London, what we've really turned to, I think, uh, is, is looking at how artists respond to uh, the context here. Uh, you know, they bring in their lived experience, but perhaps there are moments when um, those meeting points uh, emerge and with with a particular community with a in a particular neighborhood setting um, and that's what I think is really exciting that that really emerges in Shabak that we're not really thinking about um, you know what presenting something that is you know is, is as I can't say considered aesthetically pleasing and beautiful and that's it you know and and it works for that for its own sake um, but also thinking about what is the impact, you know, when we talk about contemporary Arab culture and why some, sometimes people can, can, you know, take that, that gasp of air and being like, oh, I, I don't understand art or I don't understand contemporary culture. This space isn't for me. It's about really interrogating that. Why isn't that space for you? Um, and it's not, and it's the onus isn't on, on them, but it, the onus is on us as, as curators, as programmers, as producers, um, to open up those spaces. So I think really where what's very exciting at the moment in, in the cultural sector, although we've experienced, you know, in the past 10 years with like extreme cuts to the arts, what has also emerged particularly within contemporary Arab culture is, a, is thinking about how to, you know, dismantle the status quo artistically, yes, um, but also how we can reduce uh, those barriers to accessing the arts as well. So what are some of those barriers uh, for the uneducated? What are some of the uh, like basic barriers that are, um, that are um, navigable, but also some that are sticky and sort of uh, unpenetrable? Socioeconomic barriers. You know, the pure, if we go back to pure principle of affordability of, of, of how much a ticket costs to attend a particular concert or theater, but also um, those barriers, well, barriers existing because of, if we go back to, to, to societal uh, barriers, it, it transfers onto, onto the art world as well. It's the same, uh, we, you know, it, you're, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sense of, of, you know, whether you come from a particular background and demographic and lived experience, you um, automatically are at a disadvantage. So again, you know, through race and, and, and class and your sexual identity. Um, uh, also, I would say that language plays a real sticking 
barrier here, you know, with there's such pressure, particularly on communities uh, from the Swana region to kind of acclimatize uh, really quickly. And when you're trying to do that, maybe accessing an art event or being involved in an arts project isn't your immediate priority, you know, you're, you're, you're concentrating on surviving. So how can we, um, how can we come in? You know, in that because part of, of course, you've you've got to go to your immediate survival mode. But how can the arts um, infiltrate that, and how can we work towards creating a fairer ecosystem um, as well? So I think one thing that we're we're doing is increasing Arabic and other Swana um, language-based work. Not only you know, there's a real tendency in this country to fear work that isn't in the English language. It's, it's way more than Europe, you know? So that's, that's one way to, to counteract it and to really take the work to communities as well and, and, and you know, ensuring that, that, that you're, you're reaching them really. Um, and, the, and another way of reducing barriers is, is, is for, to give them the opportunity to make the work, to really trust that it's not just someone who calls themselves an artist to be able to take up this space. Yeah. Okay, so Rua, I have a question for you. As somebody who came into this space as a viewer originally, and now you're a member of the team and sort of um, um, see, see how, see how the, the sausage is made, so to speak, um, what do you think is, uh, what are some of the things that were, you, sort of surprised you about the process of um, putting the festival together and, uh, and how Shebek operates. And then what is, um, what is a little different about the way the festival is being put together this year as compared to maybe the way you experienced it in previous years? Okay, um, in terms of your first question, I think myself, and I would say, I, I mean, I've had this conversation with other young Shebekis, um, we're so fascinated by what goes on in Eckhart and Tehrid and Jackie's here. What goes on in your brains, and how, what, what, like, how do the gears work to make what happens happen? What makes the things that are possible possible? And what's happened through our experience is that they've been imparting that knowledge onto us, but also not in a way that's condescending at all. In a way, rather that invites us to kind of scope out that those answers ourselves and just be guided down those paths and to be a little bit more um, concrete about that because that's quite an abstract but like one example that I can think of is is um, in August when uh, the explosion happened in Beirut a lot of us were like we have a platform here what can we do about it you know let's let's try to figure out how we can use our networks in London to be able to contribute back to the place that a lot of us care about. Um, and that was the first time I was on the phone with Eckhart, for example. Um, and he was really guiding um, us, the group of us that were putting together this fundraiser in terms of how to make it happen, how to reach people and how to let other people into our world. I think that's something that Shabak does really well. It's, 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 what Tehreed was saying about real life experiences is about things that are personal. It's about letting others, whether you want to call them audience or just people in general, into the world of the creative, whether it's the artist or the producer or the festival as a whole. Um, and what it means as well, something that I hadn't thought about, but I started thinking about it while on calls with the group and um, with Eckhart, Tehreed and Jackie is, okay, what does a festival mean? And it didn't occur to me on this call that it is about that collaboration with other venues. Like that's what separates a festival from just an, a, a, a building, right? A singular institution that's housed somewhere. And it's that form of connection that inspires me as well. It's that form of connection across places, people, space, art forms. Um, and I didn't know how, like, because you can kind of give basic building blocks, but there are nuances, especially as, um, like, creatives, producers from the Swana region. There was a master class that we had with Alia Zohi. And one of the things that I remember most is she was saying, if you come from a place, a country that was colonized, and you're a producer, 
um, it's a good idea to have coaching as well. And that started springing things for me in terms of how to avoid burnout when it comes to producing. Beyond actually producing something, how do I take care of myself as well while we're on the grind? Um, and then just so much support from each other. I think it's all, I, I can say so much, but it's, it's admirable, like, the transparency and communication that happens in the senior team and how that also transfers towards us um, and how we end up, you know, I feel a strong connection to everyone in the collective. I feel like I can reach out to them and, and ask for their input and, and offer myself to them and be honest. Um, what was your second question? The second question is, as as a uh, as somebody who's uh, was a viewer and now involved, you've seen some sort of you've had the opportunity to see some sort of progression. So, what feels different about this year, uh, the programming about this year compared to other years? Um, it's hard to say, not having experienced the festival yet this year. Um, I am excited by how like it's very visible how the festival has been responding to today. It's very visible how um, even, even within the context of like Arabs and the Arab world and the Swana region within London, which is underrepresented, what are the voices within the region that are underrepresented as well? So now you have a lot of black Arabs that are part of the festival, Kurdish voices, um, there's always been um, queer voices as part of the festival. Um, so it's, it's, it's there, it's concrete, you can see it. Um, beyond that as well, the access thing is very visible. I like how there are things online. I like how there's a mix, you know? We, there, there's things that we can take away from the pandemic that we learn from. And to be able to interact and engage with a piece of art in ways that are comfortable for many in both ends to do it from a place of doing it in person versus um, doing it from one's own home. There is a different sense of connection, but I like that there's that mix. Um, Great. Um, Eckhart, what about for you? Yeah. I, 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 what, what feels different about this year in particular and what should people be particularly excited about this year as uh, as opposed to other years? What were some of the, the highlights yeah. and maybe the lowlights, some of the challenges that you've had to respond to? <laughs> well, let's start with the low light. The low light really is completely outside our control. And unfortunately, we cannot welcome as many artists physically in London as we would in previous years, you know, when, um, and that's just to do with the pandemic and international travel um, not, not being possible yet and venues not being open yet or only in a very limited way. Um, Before you keep on going, can you give me a sense of scale? Like uh, in previous years, how yeah. many artists do you typically invite and how, how much, how depressed is, are those numbers this year? Yeah, so in terms of international, physical visits in previous years, we would have had about 100 artists come to London. I mean, in the last festival, we, I think we processed something like um, 82 visas, and some artists don't need visas, so, you know, it would have been significantly more. Uh, this year, we probably have about 10 artists who physically come from abroad. Of course, we have fantastic Arab talent in the UK, who, you know, that we that we present to. Um, but I think the upside of this that you said, and I'm so pleased to hear we will speak about this, is the online program, which actually connects us into the region. And we thought about what can we do? And I think one of our first idea was if we cannot bring artists here this year, what we should but they, we still want to be helpful with them creating their work. You know, this shouldn't be a reason for stopping the creation of work and stopping working. So we then talked to many artists about how they can, can continue to work and bring the work in another way. So for instance, the, um, you know, it, it Ain't Where You're From, uh, the wonderful um, commission from Philip Rashid that presents the, a new scene of hip hop in the Gulf. 
initially some of those guys would have come to London, um, but now become a fantastic film. They rehearsed in Al Sakal Avenue um, in Dubai. That they they've they've had film crews going out to different locations, um, and we can then still bring the work globally here. Um, and and we went to partners like Fada, like where we have um, live streams from Gaza, from Khartoum. Um, we work with the UNESCO City of um, Literature, Slemani, uh, to have a live poetry night. What it gave us, the opportunity, is that actually this year's Shabak is much less London, <laughs> but much more global, much more international. And I think our approach has been, we want to be your guest and we want you to be our guest. Um, and that really led to a very different curatorial approach. The previous one was much more about invitations, kind of come to us with something. This year I really felt is, can we be your guest and can you be our guest? So, we knock on their doors, they knock on our doors. And, um, and I think that's led to a very different type of programming, um, which I'm really pleased about. Interesting. Do you, um, I don't know the answer to this question. I'm, I'm embarrassed I don't know the answer to this question. What role does, uh, how do you think about archiving? Because, you know, festivals are these, these uh, temporal windows, uh, no pun intended, where all these events happen and there's opportunities to connect with each other and the artists are your constituents as much as the attendees are your constituents and you're trying to create connections between uh, all these people. But if if there's no archive, then it's ephemeral and the, and the fairy dust goes away and then it's all gone. How do you guys think about archiving and making sure that that experience can be uh, broadcast later? and uh, and uh, access later. This uh, I don't know who should answer this question, but somebody please, because <laughs> I'm very curious about it. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, because we present work, some of the archiving is of course done with our partner organizations and with the artists themselves. It's not necessarily us who have to archive the work. Um, but we do, of course, keep a very strong record of um, our festival program as such. Um, and you can see, as you've, you've been very impressed that you've dug out all the, um, all the images of the previous festivals, you can find information about all our previous programs um, on our website. This is only going to get better. Our website has actually become much, much more active as a repository of um, what we call evergreen content. So in the last year, I think we've really progressed this. For instance, our discussions um, against disappearance are now available to watch at any time again. So I think we've going through a process at the moment where we are probably relatively weak in the earlier festivals where we have a PDF of the brochure to future festivals, so actually most of the content will be available for much, much longer. And the festival won't just be in its moment. Interesting. Um, so I'm curious, can we talk about the constituencies for a second? Um, because there's this idea that you mentioned, uh, and Tahrir, maybe you can, uh, you can talk about this a little bit. When you think about uh, who the constituencies are, um, today for this year's festival compared to over the, the last decade, has that changed in terms of the artists who you're trying to approach and in terms of the audience? Because there's this, this concept that Ecker just mentioned where it's like, let, let, us, be, uh, let us be your guests and uh, you know, let, we'll let you be our guests type thing. Um, so I would imagine that has changed, the constituency has changed. Yes, absolutely in this festival because uh, it's much more global. So we will have audiences uh, joining us live from several different cities in the Swana region. You know, uh, we've got, as, as Eckhart was mentioning, Soleimani, we have uh, Riyadh, we have Gaza, etc. So there is that element that, of course, it's a far more global audience in terms of within kind of the 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 micro of, of London itself, our 
our constituents have changed, uh, I think, dramatically over the years. We've really increased our Arab identifying audiences and other um, minorities uh, from the Swana region. It's the way, um, and here, to, uh, the way our consensus worked, it, it didn't, you didn't always, uh, you weren't always able to access that information of how people identify their ethnicity. Even just the Arab box was was is, is very is quite new, really. Um, just and so for us, though, um, we where we've gained that knowledge is is that we know that more Arab audiences, thankfully, um, do access the festival, and and that really largely has to do with making sure that that they're in, directly involved. You know, um, it, it, you know, going back to what you say about. What you ask about archiving, I think it's in, it, and, and the ephemeral, it's in those, um, it is in those moments that you can't quite capture in, in you know, in, in, in the 2D uh, world. And it is in that legacy, it is in that kind of the, that return, you know, that, that people do return to the festival and say, ah, it's actually changed. And part of that change is that they hear more of their own language being spoken there as well. So I think there's a, there's a long way to go within the UK in terms of um, audience accessibility, but I'm, I'm really pleased that, that far more Arab audiences uh, are uh, directly experiencing the festival. Yeah. Are there, um... Are there, and this again is for anyone, are there like sibling festivals uh, that exist like Shabak around the world that focus on contemporary Arab art that are part of a global ecosystem where, you know, the tide uh, raises all ships? Because um, I'm not aware of that, but yeah. maybe there are. There are others that tend to be a bit more art from specific. You know, there's there's a there's a very large network, for instance, of Palestinian film festivals. Yeah. Uh, there is an art festival in Montreal, which is quite music um, dominated. Arabesque is again quite music um, um, uh, dominated in in France. Um, uh, um, the dance festival in Holland. Um, and of course, there's some festivals that have always had a very strong presence of Arab artists. So, so there isn't a kind of a copycat festival of Shabak, and probably there shouldn't be one either, I, I, would, I would say. But there are other festivals that, where we share a lot of program with, and we are very closely connected with them. And in uh, between 2017 and 19, we had a very good EU funded network of festivals across Europe that had the promotion of Arab theatre makers very much in their core, in their core mission. And that was a fantastic um, partnership that meant that the artists we commissioned could tour to our six or eight festivals. Um, and we had a stronger common voice. Yeah. Could you imagine? A oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry, please. Just to say some of the best festivals I've been to are, were in Tunis and, uh, and Beirut. And so, so I think, you know, that, and, and I've seen a lot of models trying to emulate those, those experiences in, in Europe and the US. Um, yeah, because I wonder, like, uh, um, I think obviously the festival hasn't kicked off and we'll see how, <laughs> how, how you all feel in, in two months. But I would imagine that uh, what, this experience, the last 16 months has told us that that maybe things are a little more portable than we once imagined. And could there be Shabak Berlin and Shabak uh, Khartoum and Shabak uh, Tunis and Shabak Beirut and Shabak Boston? Um, could that be uh, something that happens in the next decade? Or is this is this deeply rooted in London? This this is as much about the window being placed in London and you looking out from London as, as much as the Arab world looking into London? I think, well, I, Shabak is very deeply rooted in London in its terms of origin. It's where it came from, how it initially operated. Um, 
And I think every good festival should be completely rooted in the location where it's in. Um, Shabbat shouldn't become an export festival that we sort of go somewhere. So it's, it's a bit, uh, what I said earlier, it's about invitations. I think if there is something within, within a Shabbat model that really is beneficial in another place to be morphed into whatever the most relevant version is in another place, we would be very, very open and happy to have that conversation. But I think um, we would be very careful and actually try to resist probably to just move this model elsewhere where it would not be on the right ground. We've actually tried it the other way around a little bit. So in 2017, <clears throat> Sarri just mentioned it, we invited the Nahnawal Amarwal Jiran Festival from Beirut and the Dream City Festival from um, Tunis um, to co-curate some elements of Shabak in London, because I felt as as a festival of contemporary Arab culture, how can we not just show contemporary Arab artists, but contemporary festival practice in the Arab world? And I felt both in Nahnawal Amar al Jiran as well as Dream City were really interesting and progressive models. So I invited them to reconceive their ideas to fit a London context. And it was a really wonderful, um, a really wonderful experience where we learned a lot. And I hope they also went away with some new ideas. So that kind of reciprocity I could see, but I wouldn't like to artificially have a copycat Shabak that sort of in a sort of corporate way um, um, spread out to the rest of the world. Okay, great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the questions we have two so far, um, and then I'm sure we'll have a few more and then I'll end with a final question. Uh, Hala, I think you're the first one. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering uh, what is the contribution of the Young Shabak in the 2021 festival? Perfect question. Riwa. Yes, so, so, so we spent our first year learning how to produce events. Now that it's festival season and the year upcoming to that, we had the opportunity to cu curate and uh, produce our own uh, events with support. So we started with some brainstorming and we came up with Sawa Sawa, which we're all very excited about. And essentially it's um, an online platform um, for UK based um, artists from the Swana region between our age range. And we were just curious about what people our age were doing during the lockdown, how we were using art during this time as a transformative means to reconnect with our cultures, to reconnect with our communities, and to be really honest about it as well. Um, we, we thought long and hard about what this means for us because lockdown can mean many different things. And instead of it being totally future facing, we were like, why don't we just sit with today for a moment, sit with how we're all feeling right now, understand what it is and unpick, unpack um, what's going on in our lives and celebrate that before we start going forward and envisioning an abstract future. What are we imagining today about today? Um, and so we have, uh, 12 bodies of work, um, 14 artists involved. And um, it's really exciting. We have three different themes. Um, one of them looks at introspection and what it means to sit with oneself during the lockdown. One of them is about diasporic experience and what it means to connect with, reconnect with culture. And the third theme is about um, familial and intergenerational uh, creation, co-creation. So people were, were collaborating with their siblings or grandmother. Um, and that's basically our main contribution. But aside from that as well, we were uh, kept in the loop with how the festival was uh, being planned from October to today. And that's basically, that's our role. Great. Um, perfect. Let's uh, move on to a question from Sada. Let me unmute you, Sada. Hi, um, so my question's about like how or has the vision or the purpose of the programming changed since the start, like since um, 2011, kind of the intention or the 
um, the the purpose for how things are programmed changed? I guess okay. I want to think so. This it's it's quite an organic process. The the first one, the twenty eleven, as I said, initially in twenty ten was about this sort of celebration of London's connectedness with the Arab world. And it was very much about a sort of just celebratory affair and that looked at creating new economic partnerships that because of the historic moment and the Arab Spring really, really got shifted. I think what's changed since um, from 2013 13 to 19, the 2013 festival was still very much an invitation festival. Um, we also had very few resources to directly commission new work. It was very much bringing work to London. From 13, 15 onwards, we supported more UK-based artists um, to, to really nurture the kind of local or national scene here too and from 17 and 19 onwards but you know very much driven by Tahrid was the the residency programs where we invited artists to spend considerable considerable time here to create something that was very specific for London so we're becoming more so in terms of shifting the program if I I've never articulated it like this. If I look, make the very big arc now, it was something that initially was quite marketing driven to something that was very much a sort of invitation festival to now some, to a festival that is very much about a catalyst for new creations. I Great. guess also um, just to say, including co-curatorship, yeah. you know, when, when uh, Riwa, you've mentioned, you've seen that there's an increased visibility of, of Arab and Afro-Arab artists. It was important that it's not only the artists and cultural makers involved in those events, you know, outward facing that identify as, as black or Afro-Arab, but also the curator putting that event together. It wasn't right that it was myself or Eckhart or any other member of, of the team that put that event together. So Rayan Al Nayal, who's an Afro-Arab uh, artist and curator is, is who has put that together. And of course, there's, there's a whole event by Young Shabak, which, which we wouldn't have had in previous years. Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, Mira is up next. First of all, thank you for an amazing initiative. I spent 12 years in London, so I can totally relate to what you said about looking for communities and exciting uh, things about the Arab world. So uh, thank you very much for, for doing what you do. I was just curious in the context of what's happening globally and continues to happen in our very animated region, whether um, you feel that you mentioned um, that there is uh, the, the shift and increase in, um, in people who are attending the festival and you are seeing that there is um, a change there. Have you already seen a change given what's happening and are you anticipating a change for 2021? I don't quite understand the answer what change, is it about audiences? Yes, yeah, sorry, about the audience in terms of shift of uh, audiences and, uh, and participation. Yeah. Uh, in terms of curiosity about what Arab culture is about and how yeah. film can play a very important role in articulating that. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest shift in audiences we will see in this festival is that we will reach a, a more of a global audience through our online program. Um, then, and that is very exciting and it's very uncharted territory um, um, for us at the moment. Um, so, and so we will be looking and analyzing that very carefully post, post festival. I think the other thing we've noticed in the last festival particularly was how diverse the Arab audiences are within a city like London. There's no such thing than an Arab audience. Um, we had events you know, that were attended by, you know, quite traditional family audiences 
and events where you know sort of the latest hipster young stylish um uh crowd mixed and mingled um and there, there are very different audiences and i think something we are learning in shabak is um how yeah how, how diverse the audience are within themselves and we cannot generalize and that and this is why our program ought to be as wide ranging as it is. Talking specifically about that. So in our audience surveys in the last festival, um, about 20% of our audience self-identified as Arab. So this is a much higher percentage than the percent of Arabs in London. So that means we are reaching, um, we are reaching audiences, you know, Arab audiences, um, in a good way, as Tahrid pointed out. This does not actually include all our community audiences that through the work that Tahrid is doing is particularly brought to our, um, um, to our events uh, through our what is called assisted ticket scheme. But we, of course, equally pleased about the 80% that come to our festival, you know, who have not identified as, as, as Arab, but still, um, engage and encounter this really important work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for everything you do. It's wonderful. I okay. wanted to add something as well, if that's possible, um, because I don't know the numbers. I don't know how many people are coming and attending, but I resonate with your question as well, because I mentioned that one of my experiences in the last Shabak festival that I attended was Ex Adra. And I had an interesting experience when I was staying in my university accommodation. And I go back to the dorms and I sit in the kitchen and then my friends there who are from the UK, maybe from Scotland, north of England, so forth. And they told me that someone said something that was very xenophobic. And I got really upset. I got very angry. And I, I was just sitting there thinking that I'm going to this show and this show exists in London. And here you are also living in London and it exists in your environment. And you have this opportunity to go to this show and experience a story from somewhere else in the region. Ex Adra is about four people that were in a, a, a woman's prison in Syria. Um, one of them is a transgender man as well. And, and he, his story taught me about what does liberation mean for him, for example, what does freedom. So even for me, that opened my eyes. So for me to answer your question as well, I would really hope so, because the beauty of Shabak Festival as well for a region that's severely misrepresented is that it celebrates the joy that we have in the region and it celebrates what does freedom mean for us what does peace in the middle east mean for us internally and collectively and i think going off of that idea of invitation that eckhart is saying the more people are interested in the region i think people that are not connected to the region particularly will feel invited to experience and appreciate this sense Great. All right, everybody. Um, we are just at time. Thank you so much for the questions. I'm going to leave. Uh, I'm going to ask one final question and one of you can answer it. Um, what should we be most excited about uh, checking out in the next couple of months if you were to give one in, one uh, plug for people to check out? On this call, I would say the online program because right. you, you, you can all access it. You know, if I picked something in London, only a very limited number could, I would really say the online program, browse there. Um, and I know next week we will be hearing more from yeah. some of our co-curators elsewhere in another part of the UK, in Glasgow and, uh, in, and in Doha. So my tip would be online. Cool. So um, on that note, we have another one of these roundtables at the same time next week, um, which should be really, really good. Um, we have two other Africa events on Tuesday and Thursday this week, one with poet Hayan Sharada on Tuesday, and then um, on Thursday, author uh, and scholar Yasser Munif, which should be really, really good as well. Uh, so uh, this conversation will be on the podcast and on the YouTube channel in a few days. So you can look out for that and share it with your friends. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.